<laughs> well, thank you and welcome. It's so fun. There was hundreds of people that were logged in before we even were ready to get started. So we obviously know you guys are as excited about these topics as we are. I am absolutely 100% blessed to be joined by two of the, the most amazing thought leaders I've ever run into in, in you know almost 30 years now. I started when I was eight, obviously, because there's no way I could have been in this industry for that long. Uh, but 30 years of being super passionate about people, super passionate about your people, and, and really trying to unearth all the different ways that we can figure out to, to really ensure that they are, are thriving. And so with that, I'm going to introduce or have them introduce uh, the two stars of this show as I'm just kind of uh, the, you know, the energy connective tissue that's holding it all together. Uh, let's start with you, Josh Burson. Why don't you, if you've not, if you've been hiding under a rock uh, and you don't know Josh, uh, this is your chance to meet, to meet the legend. You are on mute, my friend. How many times has that been said the last, uh, you know, two years? Right. Um, thank you for the enthusiasm. Yeah, I'm, I'm an industry analyst and a consultant, and we do all sorts of research on all these topics and many, many things going on in the area of, of well-being and thriving in times of confusion. So lots and lots of things to share with everybody. Yeah, it's perfect. And I think it's that connection that you have to so many different organizations, so many different industries, all different sizes, it's going to make it make it this a super valuable conversation. Not that dissimilar from uh, our friend, Allison Borland, who uh, is also in touch with so many different folks from so many different industries, and is really uh, one of the key reasons why I joined Alight. Allison, why don't you introduce yourself? Thank you, Matt. Yes, I'm Allison Borland, and I'm responsible for the wealth and the well-being solutions here at Alight. We have the honor and privilege to interact with over 30 million American workers uh, on, on a daily basis to help support their employers' goals with respect to well-being and delivering uh, improved health and financial security. So excited about the conversation today, my first time working with Josh, and uh, ready to get started. Woohoo! All right. So before we really rock and roll on this, you guys, we had, as we looked through the list of people that are joining us, and there are hundreds of you, and it's, that's just fantastic. It means we're hitting on a topic that's, that there's a lot of interest around. Um, but you guys are from all different industries, uh, all different size of companies, and so we thought we'd best start with a poll question to make sure, because this is much more of a uh, conversational discussion. There's going to be a few slides at the end just to really land the plane on some of the, the overall concepts that we want to make sure that you're aware of. But if you look in the chat, uh, look at poll question number one. Uh, we have about, you know, we're going to use about 60 seconds. So just do your first impression on what you think uh, is your biggest ta talent challenge today. And then based on that, we're going to kind of choose our own adventure and, and go from there. So take a 30 seconds right now um, to be able to, to fill that out, and then we are going to take it uh, from there based on where you guys want to want to go. I know we need like the we how do we, HRE how do we get like the uh, you know the final Jeopardy question music that goes along with these poll questions? I would say uh, for next time, crucial. All right, you guys have about. 12 more seconds. All right. All right. I think you can remove that, uh, Pablo, if you wouldn't mind. And we will go uh, based on that. I think, Josh, I think it makes sense, actually, um, as we take down the, the, uh, the slides here. I think mm -hmm. it makes sense to to really start with you guys, you, and mm -hmm. as we're looking at attracting top talent and retaining talent, which are kind of honestly that they're kind of two sides of the same coin in a lot of ways. I think organizations are are looking at continue continue to attract the talent that they current currently have. Why don't you talk just a little bit about how that seamlessly endless demand for workers is counterbalanced or potentially even offset by some of the talk of recession that is yeah. floating around out there and, and how we can kind of make some sense of, of the environment that we're in uh, from an employer perspective. Sure. Well, okay, so I won't bother with all the slides, but let me tell you sort of 
the, the talk track. And we, we have lots and lots of data to support this, including many, many conversations. Um, so there, there is no recession in the job market at the moment. There are a few s selected layoffs for particular reasons, but the economy is thriving. In fact, the Fed is having a hard time slowing it down. Um, more jobs were created this month. It's, uh, there are 1.9 jobs open for every one person looking for a job right now. So it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of activity in hiring and a lot of mobility between companies. The quit rate or the voluntary movement is around uh, 4 million people per month in the United States, which is almost 30%. So it's a lot of mobility. Um, and now that we have inflation, we have a new effect taking place which is new research shows that people who meet, leave their employers are getting twice the raise as people that are staying with their employers. And some research just came out recently from Mercer and some other data from the World Economic Forum that says that the biggest employee issue today is pay, keeping up with inflation, which leads to the issues of fair pay or pay equity. So this issue of what drives you know, engaged employees keeps moving around. Now, the way we look at it, you know, in the research we've just published recently, we look at it, we call this the four R's, recruiting, retaining, reskilling, and redesigning. And if you're looking at the part of your workforce, which is the most critical or high demand, or maybe hardest to hire, you need to think about all four of these because it's very hard to recruit. And of course, recruiting is always expensive and problematic because, uh, you know, it doesn't always, you don't always get the right person. You always want to focus on retention because most research, and we have research that shows that moving somebody into a role from inside the company can be as much as six times cheaper and obviously more predictable than moving somebody, uh, having it coming from the outside. In the area of re, re, uh, retraining or reskilling, Lots of work going on in what we call career pathways, moving people from point A to point B, job A to job B, job family A to job family B, and we have skills adjacencies tools for that. And then the fourth one, redesign, takes us back to the issue of well-being. Because what all the research shows, including the conversations we're having with many of you, is that um, we still are in a world where 81% of employees are, in a sense, burned out. They want to take a vacation. They want to take some time off after the pandemic, assuming the pandemic's over, which it's kind of not. Um, the, um, they feel highly productive. And now the CEOs and CFOs are saying, oh, wait a minute, the stock just went down. We need to push people harder. Uh, maybe we're going to have a recession. Maybe we can't spend so much money. Maybe we won't do any traveling. I, I've had two companies this this week told me they've shut down all their travel. Um, and so that puts more pressure on employees. And the weirdest thing of it all is the study that came out from Microsoft last week or two weeks ago that showed that while 87% of the employees feel productive, only 12% of the leaders believe they're productive. And that's because we haven't come to grips with hybrid work. And frankly, a lot of companies are still confused as to what the hybrid work policy should be and um, you know, and of course, executives are kind of, you know, to some degree, old school many times thinking, if we don't see you in the office, we don't know what you're doing. Um, so well-being is a big issue. And one more thing just on well-being, I know we're going to dive into it, is, you know, the well-being research we've done, and we, which we've done with Alight and, and including Matt, you've been involved in this uh, for multiple, multiple careers. <laughs> A lot of the well-being issues at work are workload or their management capabilities or their flexibility things. They're not just health and wellness and fitness things. Those are important and financial fitness, especially now. But in addition to that, um, your organization has to operate in a healthy and sustainable way. We've had a lot of companies start throwing the word sustainability into the human capital, not so much environmental sustainability, but human sustainability. You know what it's like if you work 80 hours a week. You can't do that for too many weeks, and pretty soon you got nothing left. Um, and we have to um, stop extracting things from employees and start giving things to employees so that they can rebuild their resilience and continue in this new economic cycle that we're going into. So 
So that's kind of what we're seeing. It's a very challenging time, but the, but all the pieces are kind of connected together that if you take good care of your employees, most of these other problems tend to become much less of an issue. Oh, I was on mute that time. So we're one for one, you and I both. I was gonna say, I am definitely seeing that. Um, I, I think that that has become, uh, I, wanna, I don't wanna say a trend, but certainly something that we all need to be constantly aware of. And, and I think some of the hybrid work that is supposed to be there to decrease the pressures and overwhelm on employees actually uh, are doing the opposite in that we're starting to overwhelm them by this blend of work from home and 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 There's stress work from you know the funny thing i was just in a meeting with a whole bunch of companies talking about hybrid work there's a stress associated with hybrid work should i go in should i not go in can i miss this meeting do i need to commute in today or not if i commute in is there going to be anybody there what if i commute in and there's nobody there i just wasted all this time you know there's a lot of anxiety in this hybrid work if you can't create a policy that's clear that has a good reason for people to get together that people don't all adopt, you actually can make things a little tougher on employees. Oh, without a doubt. Well, and let's perfect segue uh, to bring Allison in as well. You know, Allison, I know you've spoke a ton. We, I just saw you speak at HR Tech around the impact to employees and how in kind of an uncertain environment, how we can create more resilient, more productive workforces in this world of, of constant burnout and or disengagement. And so do you want to speak a little bit to that and put put kind of the what you're seeing from from the organizations we work with? Sure. I, you know, we've done some similar, I'd say some complementary research to what Josh just worked through. And I think the themes are fairly simple, uh, similar. You know, if there's if there's good news, I don't know if it's good, but if it's good news, when we look at self-reported feelings of employees about well-being, they're basically back to pre-pandemic levels at this point. So you can argue that's good. Um, the problem is it actually wasn't very good before the pandemic either. So it's, it's certainly not great. It's just sort of out of that pit of despair that it dropped into during the pandemic. And, and some of the statistics, which I think will um, further validate what Josh just went through, about 75% of employees are reporting moderate to high stress levels. About 44% are experiencing real physical symptoms of burnout. And 40% say they have debt that is actually ruining the quality of their lives. So when you think about how people are feeling when they come to work, they have what's actually happening to them at work while they're at work, and then they have the baggage of everything else that's happening. And then we look back and we say, okay, but during the pandemic, employers really stepped up. They implemented programs, they spent money, they created SWAT teams to help make this better. And there was a significant en enhancement and broadening of efforts around diversity, equity, and inclusion, which you would expect to improve well-being and how people feel at work. However, when we look at the research, we see that only 35% of employees trust their employer to design benefit programs that are in their best interest. And 42% believe their employer offers access to leadership opportunities that are the same regardless of culture, background, or points of view. So in spite of the money that's been spent, in spite of the effort and energy, in spite of the, um, you know, all of the, the shift to hybrid and the support employees are getting, we're still sort of missing out on some of the benefits. And employers were, were trying to create a culture of trust and belonging and inclusion that employees are craving. And we don't seem to be quite yet hitting the mark. So, so when I think about how employees are feeling and what they're grappling with, it's, 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 it's that each and every day. Well, and think of that journey that they have just gone through, right? If we're now full circle that we've just been in the wilderness of the pandemic and scrambling through that and the family things, and now we're back to where we were before. I mean, it's, it's creating this, 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 a, a relationship that most employees have with their employers that is very different than I think if they're talking to their parents or talking to their grandparents, completely different than the relationship that those folks were expecting, which were more, I would say, lower on the old Maslow's hierarchy of needs of, you know, we just want safety and security. We're not looking for adventure and growth, which is, it sounds like what you're saying, Allison, is, is more what organizations need to provide their employees. 
Is that a true statement? You absolutely need to provide both. And some are even yeah. missing out on the most basic, is what we're hearing in our research, because they're not, they're not flexible enough and they're not responsive enough to the diversity of the population. So they may be, employers may be spending a lot of money and putting a lot out there, but if, if they're focused on the top level and they haven't hit the bottom, they're missing out. Yeah. And if they're focusing on the bottom but not being flexible enough, they're also, there's also a gap. So it can work in a lot of different ways. I love it. And also perfect segue, because somebody on this call happened to have written a book recently called Irresistible, which screams a lot to those themes that you were just <laughs> watching. Oh, that pop I don't know how that happened. I happen to have a copy. <laughs> I know. Uh, could you talk, there's, 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 I know when we've talked about your book, there's a few key themes that even if somebody doesn't own your book or hasn't read it, that really apply to the conversation that we were just yeah. having that I think are really foundational components of what anybody that's looking to make sure that their employees are thriving, that they're attracting the right talent uh, can be drawn yeah. to. Can you kind of go through the high level at that? Of, that, of, of course. Things? Yeah, I won't, I won't give it. Well, I want to key on something Allison just said. Um, I think most of us put some of our, a lot of our aspirations on hold during the pandemic. We just needed to get through it. So this idea of growth and getting promoted and having all sorts of new career opportunities, mm, a little bit of that, but most of us put that on hold. Now it's back again. I was just, before I talk about the book, I was in a meeting yesterday, a large financial services company, actually an insurance company, opened up this idea of an internal talent marketplace, which is this, this opportunity where people can look for gigs and projects and jobs inside the company. And so they asked the employees two questions. First of all, do you have any extra time? No, no one has any extra time. Oh, if you had extra, if you had an opportunity to do some extra project work on something that would help you grow and develop, would you have extra time? Yes, very high percentage of them said yes. How much extra time? Four, four hours a week. That's 10% of the workforce productivity that could be unleashed if you could create a diverse and inclusive way, as Allison said, for people to find other things to do inside your company that are fun, developmental, growth, or just exposure. So, and people are waiting for that. So, so, so I just wanted to throw that out there as, as something to think about. In the book, I pretty much talk about, you know, culture. I talk about the need for growth. I talk about work, not jobs. People need it, you know, people now want to work on projects that are interesting to them that may or may not be in their job description. Um, flattening the hierarchy so people have more transparency and visibility across the organization. You know, in the old world, getting back to, you know, Allison's comment about diversity, if your boss didn't know somebody to find you a new role, you're stuck. You got to do your own politicking and see who you can get to meet. And, you know, maybe you're introverted or, or you're a minority or you don't have friends with some of the other upper ups, you're stuck. That's it. Those, those are problems that are going away through these, these new ideas. Um, we talk a lot about productivity and employee experience as opposed to employee engagement. I was just on a webinar earlier today where somebody was talking about employee engagement and I'm thinking, you know, we've got to kind of move that language along here because it's not just engagement. It's, it's, you know, it's are people able to get their work done? Do they feel like they have enough flexibility to do it the way we want to do it? Is the hybrid work policy making work easier or more confusing? Um, you know, those kinds of things are very management oriented things. And then, um, you know, the issues of, uh, of fair pay, equitable pay, and a safe and psychologically safe workplace. Another piece of data that I found fascinating just in the last few weeks that I, I shared with some CHROs, and they didn't believe me, but later they did as we talked it through. According to the American Psychological Association, today, 40 to 45 percent of employees go to work scared. They're scared that they're not going to do the right thing, that their boss is going to find something that they're not doing correctly, that they're going to say the wrong thing in a meeting or whatever. I think this, you know, this issue of people having a little bit of imposter syndrome and not sure what they're going to do to make impact at work is, is sitting there for us to deal with. So psychological safety is a lot of, of building an irresistible organization. And the fundamental idea of the book anyway is really giving you these seven principles to, to unleash what I call human spirit. 
because every company that I've talked to that thrives um, contributes to employees' well-being in a way that the employees can then contribute to the company's mission and they want to be part of the company's mission. You know, I have never met anybody in my career in all of the things I've done that didn't want to do a good job at work, ever. And I've probably met 10,000 people in different roles, but they sometimes don't know how to do that or they're being held back or the work is too hard or they're not trained or it's not safe or the systems don't work right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of building an irresistible organization is these issues of culture, giving people empowerment, developing people, creating a safe experience, and then really designing the company so they can succeed. And that's why we have that last, the fourth R of, of redesign is, you know, what happened during the pandemic is a lot of jobs just got harder. You know, the people in the stores jobs got harder, the nurses jobs got harder, uh, those retail salespeople's jobs got harder because we have more things to do. We had to wear a mask. We had, you know, different different delivery systems. Of course, they're burned out. I mean, you know, we've got to go back and relook at those jobs. So, so all four of these things kind of come together to me in this in this need to, to create a thriving organization. Yeah, I mean, when you think about it, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, Josh, I mean, most of people think of well-being as somewhere near the top self-esteem, self-actualization, but what you're describing it, it, as fear, right? That is not- it Takes you down it, to the bottom. It's way at well, the bottom. Well, and also what, what Allison just said, I, if, I forget the statistic, 30, 40% of people feel financial stress. You're not gonna come to work productive if you're worried about paying the rent. Yeah. You, you're already, you've already just lost 20 or 30% of your productivity right there. So, um, you know, financial flexibility, I, I was on the phone yesterday with a company that uses their um, their tuition reimbursement dollars to let employees pay off their student loans, not just oh. get new degrees, but pay off the old ones that they haven't been able to get money out of. Um, and I think this is just what we have to do as employers. So we just have to make sure people can do their jobs and are successful. And, and it sounds like we are looking for our our employers we as employees um or those of us that are employees are looking for our employers to take on much more than oh provide me some benefits or oh make sure i have a laptop uh if i work from home it sounds like we're moving more to really being partners in that entire well-being journey whether it's on my on my health or or on my well, I think it's or, even more than that. I, I, yeah, I, I get it. I, I think it's I think it's the old model was reward centric. Let's give the employees more stuff. The new one is let's design things to be good for employees. Let's actually break what we're doing and do it better, not just throw more stuff at people. Because you know, when I was at Deloitte, we had ninety. I found out there were ninety well being programs. I didn't know what any of them were. We still stressed out working there. Uh, but if somebody went down, and they did actually while I was there, they went down and they looked at the work design of how people were doing projects and why they were getting on planes on Sundays and coming home on Thursday nights exhausted. Um, and they changed a lot of that to create a new model for consulting. And that's true in retail and in healthcare and all these industries. So, so I think well-being isn't just about, you know, giving people more stuff. It's also kind of redesigning the way the place operates so people can be healthier and can be more productive. Yeah, Allison, I'm, I'm sure you have stuff to add there. I mean, this has been your, you've been breathing life into this conversation, you know, for a long time. So a lot of that is really resonating with me. And especially when you think about large scaled organizations who have incredibly diverse populations and you have to redesign it in a way that meets the needs of incredibly different parts of the workforce in a way that's still um, scalable, compliant, makes sense. And, and you may actually need 90 programs, but how on earth do you get those 90 programs and get the right ones to the right people? So I only need to know about the three of them that I need and I do not have to sort through the other 87. And now there's been so much evolution in technology, right, to enable that kind of redesign, whether it's hybrid or in the office. It's, it's been fabulous to watch. And, and that's actually a good segue into 
to what I would love to chat about with respect to the, the journey of well-being and how we've been watching employers sort of go through this process to achieve some of what Josh just talked about. And it's, it's fascinating because if you think back, and, and I'd actually ask us to go ahead and pull up the, the slide about the well-being journey, and there will also be a poll question that shows up on the right as I walk through this journey. I would love to hear from you where you think you are in the journey, and then we will be able to pull up the poll results when we're done. Um, we're, we're talking with hundreds of organizations, right? We have lots of clients. and. The mandate from the C-suite around, we have to do something about well-being. You know, we need to take action. Our employees need it. We read a book by Josh Burson, and it says it needs to be incredibly important, right? So they're taking action, but then they're saying, well, what, okay, what does that mean? What do we have today, and where do we need to go, and how do we build that strategy? And so we've, we've categorized um, the the types of well-being strategies that are out there today into a few buckets. And this is not super scientific, right, sort of gut feel. But in the more traditional sense, employers have traditional benefits. They have retirement benefits. They have health care benefits. And there may be a lot of programs from the record keeper. And there may be a lot of programs from the health care providers um, that are included. But it's really sort of that old way that Josh talked about where you put some programs out there that are pretty standard and you hope people use them. So that's A, traditional. The second one includes those programs, but also adds maybe not 90, but at least a handful of targeted point solutions to meet those critical needs that are, that are a key to health claims costs or to an organization. It could be MSK or musculoskeletal support. It could be diabetes management. So there's some extra help there. So that's level two or B, targeted point solutions. And then you have uh, the third, proactive but lacking. Here, there is actually a well-being strategy that's clearly articulated and defined by HR or by the leadership of the company. So there's a strategy there. There are programs there. But you know, nobody's really using it. Engagement's not there. Maybe this is where you have the 90 programs, but no one's really paying attention to how are they being used? What's the return on that investment? You know, how is it going? So there's a strategy, but results are lacking. Fourth, the incentives, D, this is where there's actual activation, not just engagement in the programs, but companies are actually going out and activating employees to understand what they need to do, actions they need to take. One example of how to do that, that is with incentives, where there's money or points or incentives to, to perform the actions that are going to be most critical to support that employee's well-being. And then the sort of ultimate ambition, E, holistic well-being, this is where it all comes together. So there's health and financial well-being, culture, diversity, equity, and inclusion, how people feel when they show up to work, what that work experience is. It is a well-established fabric of an organization. And I won't take uh, Josh's word of irresistible, but this is where you start to feel that way, right, when you come to work. So that's kind of the ultimate. So hopefully as I talk through these, you were, you were listening and, and sort of picked one over on the right. And I would love to be able to show those results here if we can pop them up and, and see if the results are consistent with what we've seen in other, other places. So I'll give it a second to see if that works. Getting those last answers in. And I am not seeing them. I am not see? either. Okay. So well, talk about what you, you'd expect to see in this case, Allison. Yeah. So typically there's a lot in the middle three and a smattering in the traditional and a smattering in the holistic well-being who are truly sort of the leaders in those organizations who are paving the way and have been embroiled and focused on well-being often well before the pandemic. Um, and so here it looks like we have a smattering across the board. Okay, so that's generally consistent. So let's close those out and let's keep going. And, and what I want to talk to you about is as we have these conversations and we identify where employers are on the journey, um, we like to sort of bring them along the way and, and we get the question, what does good look like? And how should we think about how to you know, map this out for our employee population? So we have a very simple high level framework on the next page. And this is really about focusing on uh, you know, how people are feeling when they come to work and it's a high-level categorization that we use with employers. There's a healthy body, a healthy wallet, a healthy mind, and a healthy life. 
And this is a simple way to talk and think about the programs that are available. And we're on the next page uh, that has the four bullets or the four circles. And the, what, the other point that I want to make, many employers actually use this framing with their employees, right, to talk about their programs. But you see the, the parts at the bottom, diversity, equity, inclusion, and culture. One of the learnings um, of, of all of our work here and, and all of the research that's generally available is that you can't really separate those. If you don't have a good work culture and a strong work culture, you're not going to be able to help employees achieve well-being because of fear and all of the other things Josh talked about. So they're really inextricably linked. And if we go through like what the question of what good looks like, I'll show you a, a framework that we put together to, to help employers um, talk through it and categorize what they have today and try to identify the gaps. And if you, if you start at the top, engagement and activation through personal well-being plans, content, and incentives, in order to help individuals with their well-being. They need to provide information. They need to take action. They need to care and they need to engage. It can't just be throwing spaghetti of a wall at, at you know, dozens of programs and knowing that employees or trusting employees will figure it out when they need it. There's got to be active engagement there. Next, when employees are engaged and they're providing information, they may be performing an assessment, you have to have solutions to actually help them with the problems. This is where those 90 programs might fit, right? Some might be multi-tiered, where they're focused on healthy body and healthy mind. Others are going to be more specific, like financial planning would generally be in the healthy wallet. But through that engagement at the higher level, that will help individuals sort and understand what they need and help the program like raise the right programs for each individual. We also know that there's been a proliferate, proliferate many different um, uh, digital and other new solutions that have come and been brought to market, and I'll get my words right later, in all of these different four areas, right? There's lots of act, um, activity and new apps and new programs, however, especially when something big happens, something emotional happens, sometimes you need to talk to that expert, right? So we want to complement all of the apps and the programs with high-touch concierge navigation and trusted guidance. When you're going through a really uh, meaningful financial issue or a, a cancer diagnosis or a death in your family, sometimes you need that high-touch. So we consider that a, a very important part of a strong well-being ecosystem, whether that's at the employer or whether it's through a third party. And then finally, the program has to have embedded flexibility and choice to meet unique and diverse needs, right? It can't be one size fits all. It can't just be a 401k plan and a health plan. It has to be more than that. This, could, this is where tools like lifestyle accounts might come in, so employees have flexibility, perhaps a well-being marketplace, so they can use their points and their incentives to, to make purchases that are relevant and specific to them. Um, all of that is uh, a part of what we consider a good well-being framework. Um, and then finally, what's on the left, and also you will notice goes all the way around, is this has to be pulled together in a meaningful way, in a way that it can engage with employees to get the right solutions to the right people versus a link farm to all of those dozens of programs. So that engagement platform that then can help measure and quantify the utilization, can help quantify the ROI so employers know what they're spending, if it's working and what the impact is, uh, and then be able to tailor those programs on an ongoing basis to really kind of optimize results and go from there. So to help bring this to life, um, we, we want to look at the lens through an employee named Mary. And Mary may resonate with many of you. She's a lot like a lot of us. She's 43. She's married. She has two children. Her spouse also works full time. So as you can imagine, two very athletic children. Her life is chaos and hectic, um, which, which is, is very common, of course. And she has recently moved. So she doesn't have great knowledge and access of her surroundings. And she has been in the world of traditional benefits inertia. So, you know, come annual enrollment, she gets a ton of different um, brochures and information from all of these different vendors. It's overwhelming. It's intimidating. She's really busy. So she just defaults into that PPO that she's been in for years. She was auto-enrolled into the 401k plan, so she has, she has a pretty good balance there. Uh, but hasn't done really anything else with her savings, not a real rainy day fund. She's just going from day to day, right? 
So then think about what happens on any random Thursday, right? Just any day of the week. And she's hit with a, a fairly small event. Her son injures his knee playing soccer. So what does she do? Well, she pulls up Google Maps and she goes to the nearest ER because her son's been injured, right? Why wouldn't she? So she does that. There are significant costs because one, it's an emergency room, and two, the anesthesiologist is out of network. So she doesn't have an emergency fund, so she has to pull money from her 401k, and she puts the rest on a high interest rate credit card because that's the only option she has. And then she goes about her day, her son gets better, and she's back at work. She's more stressed, she's damaged her short-term and long-term financial position, um, and, and she's in a pretty rough spot, right? Um, so that's how she shows up to work the next week. So now let's go forward and let's imagine had she been working for an employer with a mature holistic well-being program in place, why would things be different? I'd give you five things that would be different. First, she would have been, she would have received outreach and said, hey, come just answer a few questions. Let's do a well-being assessment. And through that assessment, we know she doesn't have a rainy day fund, no emergency savings. We would be able to then give her some quick tools and support so she can allocate her dollars across 401k, HSA, and emergency savings so that she would have emergency savings ready when she needed it. And number two, the reason she has an HSA is she, she's received careful guidance and had access to a concierge guidance. Um, counselor who was able to show her the value of a lower cost, cost health plan that includes an HSA. So now she's saved more broadly, she's more ready for emergencies. Third, when her son is injured, she pulls up her app and she finds a higher quality urgent care um, place to take her son uh, right there and go straight there for significantly lower out-of-pocket costs and better care. So because she has that relationship, she has access to that to better um, it's a better outcome. So number four, her long-term savings is preserved, so she doesn't raid her 401k. She has a choice, and she can make an educated choice with help between does she use her HSA or does she use her rainy day fund and leave her HSA for retirement. That's the level of, of thought she's able to put in, and she has trusted counselors who can help her. And then finally, the fifth reason, through this well-being program support, she has access to help for, to her son in the recovery process. She has help to deal with stress, stress and manage the stress, maybe even have additional support for backup child care she may need with her son. And she could even use a well-being marketplace to go out and get food delivery while she's caring for her son. So it's an entirely different experience. And you think about Mary on that one given Thursday, and you think about all all of the other days, and then you think about all of the other employees at an organization who are being affected by this approach, and even more so if it's surrounded by a positive work culture where she feels supported and engaged and belongs when she's working every day. Then you can start to believe the hype and understand why it's worth writing books about this and spending the time and effort to truly design uh, an end-to-end -end holistic well-being program. So. I love it, Allison. It reminds me of, of any of those exponential value stories, you know, go. And unfortunately, if you look that up, by the way, most of them are like Ebola, COVID, food spoilage, nuclear reactions. But I think my favorite is the, uh, the example of the water hyacinth that doubles in size every, uh, I think it's every week. Um, based on the daughters that it creates and how it, you know, if you think about 10 plants, um, in, in something as simple as three months, that'll grow to 600 plants and something as simple as an entire summer growing season, that's like somewhere in the neighborhood of 60,000 plants. So I can start to see it starting to, to create that value. Josh, are you starting to see organizations that are, are thinking this way or is this still, you know, too far up on the pyramid? I think, well, first of all, I wanna work for this company that you guys have here. <laughs> You know, I, I think this is just unbelievable what you guys have done at Alight. Um, because the, the problem that I've found when I talk to companies about this is there's sort of this workforce segmentation problem. The truck drivers have this issue. The remote salespeople have this issue. The executives have this issue. The software engineers have this issue. And so the benefits administration group is trying to come up with some sort of peanut butter solution that applies to everybody, but they can't possibly personalize it like this. 
And so what you guys have done through, you know, the combination of having a wide range of offerings and then really design thinking this is you can make it personal for everybody. And I think the other thing that's interesting about this scenario is, you know, I was thinking about it. I don't know if you guys, last time you went to the doctor's office, they ask you this funny question. Do you feel safe at home? Have you noticed that? Yeah. They're trying to figure out the things that you don't want to say that are driving you crazy. And this is the issue of well-being, is that a lot of the things that drive you crazy at work, you don't want to tell anybody about because maybe they're going to get somebody upset or maybe it's about your manager or maybe it's your personal stuff or maybe you didn't manage your credit card correctly and now you're suffering with it. So I think this kind of solution is, um, you know, really, really powerful. I, I would guess, Allison, that this is 5 to 10% of the market can do something like this today because what I find is, Companies like Deloitte, they got the 90 things and they're just sprinkling them around and trying to get people to understand what they all are. Yeah, you know, Josh, it's funny that you say that because one of the most common conversations we have with clients right now is around utilization. Is okay, we spent all this time, we did all this right. research, we've launched all of these programs and no one is using them, or we don't know if anyone is using them. So we're, we're focusing a lot of energy and investment now on how do we create those closed loop results so that we can help employers track which employees are using which programs and what's the return. Because what we find is some programs are there for 3% of the population. Right. They're not there for 97%. But are the right three people, the right three percentage of people using it? And, and, and so that's a huge area of focus. And, the you know, with all the development and uh, innovation in tech and data and, and sharing of data and open APIs, we're not now able to really start quantifying some of that. Um, and the conversations are then fabulous. And then it enables the, the well-being program or the ecosystem to design and change um, over time in accordance with how needs are changing. Um, and part of that is understanding healthcare claims. Part of that is understanding employee feedback from surveys or focus groups. It's really getting the full picture. So when we think about the leaders who are really doing this well, um, and to be fair, even the leaders are really just getting started with, with this next level of, of work. It's, it's, it's really exciting to think about what the future can hold uh, and what employers will be able to do and the lives they'll be able to impact. And then the results that we'll have when you have employees like Mary showing up to work engaged and excited and comfortable and she feels safe and she knows what's happening in her house is, is okay. Um, so it's, it's well, there's really another, and the other, there's another thing you guys do that I think is a value add, which is you're a big company and you have access to lots of providers and you can vet the market and you can sit, figure out what's new and innovative and what's going mainstream. The average HR person can't possibly keep up with all that stuff. And so they're getting flooded with salespeople and, you know, emails and whatever. They can't experiment with all this stuff. You're doing that on behalf of them. So, um, you know, I think you're providing a huge value proposition to this market. Yeah, I'm going to add one more piece to that, Josh, that I think is is important because there's been a bunch of questions around around engagement. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's that, and and you said this, Allison, in your HR tech presentation so well. It's the amount of data, but also the amount of traffic that we're getting because we're bringing all of this goodness together on a single platform that I think allows that kind of dynamic and robust personalization that we, we don't necessarily see when you just add 90 programs and stack them all and say, you know, choose your own adventure employee. I hope you feel supported. Allison, I was gonna ask you, are we seeing results from this? I think you have a slide in here that show that we actually, for those 5% of people, there's real tangible ROI results of this. There, there is, and we're, we're just getting started and figuring out how to measure and quantify the entire ecosystem, but here are a few examples. So uh, EAP, right? The vast majority of organizations have an employee assistance program. Generally, the utilization is very low, but when the right people use it, it saves money in mental health visits. It improves productivity. Um, there are multiple benefits, and so with one organization, we focused on activation, right? So getting the right people who, who need it to use it and highlighting the value of the EAP. And we drove up utilization by 55%. That, um, that, that organization that provides that support quantifies the value at $1.7 million, right, to the employer because of, you know, savings and claims and other factors. So, so there's real money to be had just by getting the right people to use the right programs.
The second one is, is a similar approach to driving telehealth, right? Telehealth is something that's, in many cases, during the pandemic, but also beyond, easier, faster, more comfortable for many um, uh, employees to, you know, have care in their home if the if the if it, it's warranted, and by focusing on highlighting the value to the right people and focusing on preventive care that can be delivered in this way, there's real money to be saved both for the employee and for the employer. And so we saw a 50% increase in utilization by leveraging this platform and this approach. Uh, and then finally, um, while there may not be as discreet of an ROI to the employer, financial security is increasing like increasingly recognized as absolutely critical to overall well-being. And when we look across how employees categorize how they feel about the four different healthy body, healthy mind, healthy wallet, healthy life, healthy wallet consistently receives the lowest score. So it's where employees report the, the highest level of stress. And mm. so by, again, focusing on this proactive um, engagement and activation for employees to, to make good choices and make it super easy for them to do so, we see some real increases in 401k savings. We have similar approaches to use for emergency funds and then, you know, choosing across the different choices. And we're able to quantify the results. So we're going to continue to do that and share case studies and examples with the market and continue to learn and explore as we go uh, so that we can help more organizations move toward that, uh, you know, holistic well-being approach. Uh, in the fabric of their organization. So a lot of work to be done um, and a lot, of, a, a lot of things to learn from experts in the industry as well as our, our clients. And, now, Allison, and isn't, isn't there also an ROI in the sense that you guys are, are buying these services in volume and then offering them to, to employers as they need them as opposed to each employer negotiating each one by themselves? I, 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 there has to be an ROI there too. There can be very much, uh, both an ROI from the dollars in the pricing, also an ROI in that we've done a lot of the time and energy and the due diligence on some of these partners, and we're investing in connecting through API and other data connections to their ecosystem to be able to report back to the employers um, in an aggregated way, which is very difficult for them to do on their own. So there's multiple levels of ROI and thinking about it yeah. this way, and that integrated platform all pulled together. And of course, as an employee, would you rather have one place to go or 90 to worry about, right? So there's, a, there's an embedded ROI for, for the people uh, just right there. I, I read a Forbes article recently that said the average U.S. company is asking their employees to download between 14 and 17 apps to work with them across all of these. So that's not 90, but it's certainly a, a, a folder's worth of apps on your phone. And I think the idea that you can actually have a well-being conversation with your employees through 14 to 17 different channels doesn't work that way. Like everything we buy on Amazon, we'd have to go to a different place to buy books versus electronics versus home goods. And, and that's not how Amazon works. That's not what I don't think uh, employees are expecting. So I think that that bringing it all together in a single place where the people can feel fully supported in, in a single place and not have to, you know, create the friction in the system of finding it on their own and putting that cognitive stress on themselves to do it, I think is a huge part of that. We've got some great questions. Feel free to type a question if you guys have more questions, but I thought I'd open with this one. Allison, we're gonna go right back to you, which is really all the solution you mentioned, are these, as we start to think about, we're moving to a new HR solution, technology, we're moving to the cloud, is that part of that or is this something different? Is this something to stack on top of that? I think people are confused in this. We're moving to cloud technology that's supporting HR. Where does this fit? Yeah, well, so so this doesn't replace your HCM, like your, your core HR system. Um, this is, Think of this, this ecosystem as working in close connection. Now, hopefully the data is connected, right? Because the more data you have, whether it's retirement data, health administration data, HCM data, the more data that you have, the more you can personalize the experience. So getting as much information into that ecosystem as possible um, is, is optimal. This, the, you know, the platform like the, that we offer that does this, um, it is connected uh, with other, other systems for sure. It can sit in front of them or it can sit behind them. So there's a lot of flexibility in how that's constructed. And we see a lot of different approaches employers using depending on their, their broader HR strategy 
strategy and that, that employee experience that they're creating internally. Some leverage this platform very much. Others have it as a, you know, as a connection point. So flexibility there. Yeah, absolutely. Josh, I'm going to send this one to you. Uh, we are a smaller company, fewer than 1,000 employees. Just mm -hmm. want to make sure in small HR departments, these themes should be resonating as much as some large multinational. Are I, think, you I think maybe even more. I, I was just talking to a guy earlier today who runs a 300-person company in the cement and aggregate distribution. You know, he basically runs cement trucks. And very hardworking, proactive CEO, and he said, I'm doing all of this stuff. I want people to be healthy. I don't want them to be overworked. I don't want a bunch of absenteeism. Um, I don't want them to be injured. You know, it's, it's actually worse in a small company because if somebody does leave, you, you feel it. In a big company, if somebody goes out sick or, you know, it's usually you can fill the gap, but in a small company, you can't. So um, it's even more important. And, and also, you have a very small HR department, so you're worried about hiring and pay and everything else, and you don't have enough time for this. So um, you need a solution like Alight or somebody similar to you guys, if, if you guys don't go after small companies, I don't know if you do, but um, it's just as important there, if not yeah. more. No, and I, I, I think that, that absolutely resonates in that with smaller HR departments, you need technology over and over trying to do Trying to expand. I think, and, I think and, this area is just as complicated as everything. It's probably more complicated than many of the other domains of HR. In payroll, you don't have 80 payroll providers. You <laughs> might have five. But there's very, true. maybe in learning and development, you might have 80 learning providers, but hopefully not. Where else in HR do you have 80 or 90 providers that you're trying to corral together for your employees? It's pretty hard. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, one last question, and I think I'll give it to both of you, but I'll probably start with you, Allison, which is, this is all so overwhelming, which I think is probably, we're trying to solve overwhelm for your employees, but we create overwhelming for HR departments. How should an organization like ours get started with even building a well-being strategy? Gosh, well, I, I'm actually super curious to hear what Josh says about this. But, you know, I would say starting with the basics of what goals you want to achieve, getting feedback and data is actually critical. What do your employees need? What do they want? What do your health care claims data say they need? Um, and understanding uh, where you are um, and, and the, the feedback that your employees have for you to help to, to create a set of goals and objectives of where you want to be um, when it comes to well-being and when it comes to how people feel at work. And that will help you target that discussion uh, and target that process to what's most important. Put the ecosystem map um, up on the board and then start to solve for what's critical and, and build that roadmap out. So I don't know, Josh, what do you think? I, I have a little bit of a different answer, um, different kind of answer. I don't think well-being should be owned by HR or the Compensation and Benefits Department. I think the first conversation is with the senior management team. How are we doing as an organization? How are our people doing? That kind of, you should be having that conversation pretty regularly, but if you're not, somebody has to start that conversation. From there, you'll talk about management and goals and productivity, absenteeism, employment brand, Glassdoor ratings, all that stuff. And what will fall out of that is a well-being strategy that is management-driven and management-owned. If it gets thrown over to HR and they say, oh, here's a bunch of money, go fix this. I mean, you'll do some benefit for sure, but, but it has to be you know, embraced by everybody. So, so I think that's a good way to start. And then you'll get more budget too. <laughs> You know, I was at the uh, International Glamping Convention a month ago, and people were asking, what should we build? We want to get into glamping. And the, the woman who is in charge of one of the biggest brands in the country said, you should, you should create the cocktail party you would want to go to. And so I think just to add another flavor to that is, you know, we really should be creating the well-being programs that we would want to be a part of. Because after all, most of us as organizations are a part of the same well-being programs we're, we're creating for all of our employees. So with that, Pablo, I will send it back to you. Josh Burson, thank you so much for joining me. That. Allison Borland, thank you so much for joining me. This was a lot of fun. Uh, I hope everyone on the call had as much fun as we did.